On Friday, October 11th, 1907, the bulk freighter George Stevenson faced a moderate autumn storm on Lake Superior while towing a barge downbound for the Sioux Canal. At around noon, approximately 18 miles from Deer Park, Michigan, they sighted another freighter fighting through the storm. It was the brand new 420-foot Cypress, launched only two months before, now on her second voyage. While the storm was challenging, it was nothing that a large steel freighter couldn't handle. The Cypress sailed at nearly double their speed and soon easily overtook the Stevenson. As the freighter sailed past, Captain Harbottle noticed that the Cypress was trailing a blood-red wake. As night fell, the lights of the Cypress twinkled ahead, giving the men of the Stevenson some comfort in the storm. But just before 8 p.m., long before the freighter could have crested the horizon, the Cypress's lights suddenly disappeared, leaving behind a mystery that would perplex those in the Great Lakes for decades to come. The Cypress, labeled hold number 353, was constructed in 1907 by the American Shipbuilding Company in Lorraine, Ohio. The steel hold bulk freighter was the fourth of eight nearly identical ships constructed for the Lackawanna Steamship Company. The panic of 1907 was creating a difficult economic environment, and the American Shipbuilding Company was mired with labor strikes. The Lackawanna Steamship Company was a brand new venture and its backers were eager for a return on their investment. To keep construction moving, the shipyard had new workers brought in to finish these new freighters during the strike. While not the largest on the lakes at the time, the Cypress and her fleet mates were large and well-equipped, coming in at 420 feet long, with a beam of 52 feet and a carrying capacity of 7,500 tons. She was equipped with two coal-fired Scotch boilers that powered a 1,500 horsepower triple expansion steam engine, a somewhat respectable power plant at a time when bulk freighters were notoriously underpowered for their size. The Cypress was launched on Saturday, August 17, 1907. Hazel Arnold of Marine City, Michigan christened her. She was the daughter of a Pickens Mather & Company executive, the company that owned a majority share of the new Lackawanna Steamship Company. By 1907, the 48-year-old Captain Frank Brainard Hike had 28 years of experience sailing and eight years of experience captaining ships on the Great Lakes. Only a few years prior, in 1903, Captain Hike commanded the Union Steamship Company's passenger freight steamer Shimon for seven years when the American Association of Masters and Pilots called a strike. The ship owners soon broke the strike and many sailors, including Captain Hike, were listed as agitators and were blacklisted from employment. But by 1906, an old friend, Captain William Reed, offered Hike a first mate position on the steamer Amasa Stone, which was owned by another subsidiary a Pickens Mather & Company. After a year of work, Captain Reed was able to vouch for his friend, and Hike was promised command of the company's newest ship, the Cyprus. Captain Hike was thrilled to finally return to his position. He told a friend that he had a good ship and a first-class company to work for. Captain Hike wasn't the only one excited to work on the Cypress. 17-year-old Nathan Lee Spencer was the eldest son of Port Colborne, Ontario postmaster John Spencer. Initially, Nathan studied business and even filed for the civil service exam to follow in his father's footsteps. But he soon realized that he wasn't suited for a government job. He was fascinated with machinery and marine engineering and sought a position on a lake freighter. Nathan was excited to work with the Cypress's new Scotch boilers, and he was eager to help his younger brother land a job with the company the next season. Nathan was the youngest member of the Cypress's crew of 22 men and one woman, the wife of steward William Dundon. She served as second cook. With her captain and crew satisfied with their new ship, there was no reason to think the Cypress was headed for anything but a long and prosperous career on the lakes. At 9 a.m. on Thursday, October 10, 1907, the Cypress left Superior, Wisconsin 
loaded with 7,103 tons of iron ore, just 300 tons short of her maximum capacity. The weather was calm as they sailed for Buffalo, New York, on what seemed to be a completely routine voyage. But by 10 a.m. the next day, Friday, October 11th, the weather took a turn. Around 10 miles south of Standard Light, the upbound Charles O. Jenkins encountered the Cyprus. As the downbound freighter sailed toward Captain Smith of the Jenkins, he noticed that the Cyprus was rolling heavily in the moderate seas. Enough that he felt some concern, and he kept watch on the ship as they passed, looking for them to raise a distress flag. But the two ships passed one another without exchanging any distress signals, so Captain Smith thought little more of it as he sailed on through the storm. Conditions that day slowly deteriorated as the storm blew over Lake Superior, but the lake was still heavy with ship traffic. It was widely reported that while conditions were rough, the storm was nothing too challenging, especially for larger, well-equipped vessels. When the Cypress encountered the bulk freighter George Stevenson at around noon some 18 miles off Deer Park, Michigan, Captain Harbottle of the Stevenson was towing a barge and sailing with one boiler disabled. But still, they were holding their own in the storm. Despite the ominous red wake that trailed from the new freighter, Captain Harbottle and his crew felt comfort at the sight of the Cypress, feeling confident that a freighter like that would have no problem as they plowed forward into the storm. Not long after the Stevenson first sighted the Cypress at noon, second mate Charles Pitts of the Cypress had just come off his watch and promptly went to bed. When Charlie awoke for his next shift early that evening, he found that they were rolling heavily in what was now a full gale, and concerningly, he noticed a slight list to port. After reporting for duty, he was sent to inspect the cargo hold, where he found that some of the iron ore had shifted, and there was a small but noticeable amount of water present. When he went topside, Charlie quickly saw where the water was coming from. The ship's deck and hatch covers were repeatedly submerged as waves crashed over them. Soon the storm was growing worse, and by 6.45 p.m., Charlie and the rest of the crew were growing more concerned by the increasingly heavy list to port. Then, things quickly began to unravel. Captain Hike, realizing the severity of the situation, ordered a watchman to gather all forward crew and send them aft to don life jackets and prepare the lifeboats, but he stopped short of issuing an abandoned ship. This left just Captain Hike, first mate John C. Smith, wheelsman George Thorne, and second mate Charlie Pitts in the wheelhouse at the forward end while the rest of the crew was now in the aft section, either maintaining steam power in the engine rooms or preparing to abandon the now clearly crippled freighter. Captain Hike fought to save his ship, but his primary concern was keeping his crew safe. And over the next half hour, he tensely monitored the situation, grappling over whether it would be best to keep fighting or if he should send his crew away in the small boats where they would fight their way through the storm to reach land several miles away. It was undoubtedly an impossible decision to make. Soon the Cyprus made Captain Hike's decision for him, when at just after 7.30 p.m., her port side plank shear, the edge where the spar deck meets the port hole, submerged beneath the lake, creating a now 20 degree list. Five minutes later, their fate was sealed when a call came from Chief Engineer James J. Norcross, reporting that they had lost steam pressure and the boilers had gone out. Captain Hike turned to the other three men in the pilot house and said, it's all off now. At 7.45, the four men in the pilot house raced to unlash the forward raft as the Cypress capsized onto her port side, throwing the men into the churning water. All four quickly resurfaced and soon climbed into the life raft. By the time they could catch their breaths, the Cypress was gone. In the torrent of the storm, they could hear yelling somewhere in the darkness from the crew that had gone aft, but it was impossible to reach them as the forward crew now fought to save their own lives. For several hours, the men paddled toward shore. They traveled an incredible 18 miles, constantly being thrown into the sea as heavy waves flipped the small raft over and over again. Each time, the men were able to swim back to the raft and resume their desperate struggle for survival. By 2 a.m., they were within sight of the shoreline, but then another heavy wave again flipped the raft, sending the now exhausted and freezing men into the water. Charlie resurfaced and saw the empty raft floating nearby. He mustered every ounce of strength that he had left and swam back to the tiny raft. 
But this time, as he caught his breath, he found that he was alone. Only 300 feet from the shoreline, he paddled forward until his feet touched the bottom, and he finally stumbled on the beach, unable to even stand as he crawled from the surf. In a major stroke of luck, the raft came ashore only half a mile away from the Deer Park Life Saving Station. United States Life Saving Surfman No. 7, Ralph Acha, was on a routine patrol of the lakefront when he came across Charlie, barely clinging to life. The only words that he could utter as Ralph brought him to the station was Cypress. He figured that if he was going to die, at least it would be known what ship he came from. Charlie survived six hours in the raft. The bodies of the other three men were eventually recovered near where the raft came ashore, all having lost their lives only a few hundred feet from safety. 17-year-old Nathan Lee Spencer, who was so excited to have landed a job on the freighter, was among the crew who gathered in the aft end of the ship. He likely helped maintain the ship's steam well until the end. Whether he and his fellow crew made it into a lifeboat is unclear, but his body and the bodies of all but two of the ship's crew were eventually recovered. In total, 22 people lost their lives in the disaster. As Charlie Pitts regained his strength, he was soon able to retell his experience. But as word of the tragedy spread up and down the lakes, the question of what caused the Cypress to sink soon became one of Lake Superior's most enduring mysteries. The exact cause of the Cypress disaster remains unknown. Some have speculated that she suffered an engine or rudder failure that reduced her maneuverability, leaving her especially vulnerable to the storm. It's been suggested that this or some other flaw in her construction was the result of some undiscovered mistake made by the untrained workers who completed work on the vessel during labor strikes. But no evidence for this theory has ever come to light, and the Cyprus's seven nearly identical sister ships, all built at around the same time, enjoyed long careers without any similar major incidents. In lieu of another explanation, attention turned to Captain Harbottle of the George Stevenson's report that the Cyprus was trailing a red wake. This meant that as waves broke over her deck, water was penetrating her hatches and mixing with her iron ore cargo, only to be removed by her pumps, creating a reddish hue behind the ship. The flooding probably caused her cargo to shift, creating a growing list that made her all the more vulnerable to capsizing in the storm. It was customary to secure special canvas tarpaulins over the hatches when a bulk freighter encountered heavy seas, creating a nearly watertight seal. You're probably familiar with the phrase, batten down the hatches. And that's basically what that means. It seems inconceivable that an experienced captain like Frank Hike would neglect to secure his ship given the conditions. Charlie Pitts, in his statement to investigators, claimed that the hatches were secured, but he also reported that no tarpaulins were used. 11 days after the disaster, Charlie Pitts secured a first mate position on the Maruba and returned to the lakes to resume his decades-long sailing career. He lived well into his 70s and passed away in 1961. And for a great many years, the Cyprus disaster stayed little more than a footnote. In August of 2007, the Great Lakes Shipwreck Historical Society was searching for shipwrecks near the coast of Deer Park, Michigan on Lake Superior when they made a startling discovery. Their sonar clearly indicated the long wreck of a steel freighter 460 feet below the surface. After taking measurements, they were sure that they had stumbled upon the wreck of the D.M. Clemson, which mysteriously vanished near the same spot on December 1st, 1908. A week later, the team was able to send an ROV to examine the wreck. During their first dive, they were able to confirm that the wreck was indeed a large steel freighter, but they were unable to find a name. Later that afternoon, the team conducted another dive this time sending the ROV to the ship's stern. Soon, a name appeared. Cyprus. The crew was shocked. The undiscovered wreck of the Cyprus was thought to lay at least 10 miles north of where she was found. Remarkably, the ship was intact and offered some important clues as to what brought her down. When the expedition was able to photograph and identify components of telescoping hatches still intact on the wreck, the discovery confirmed a theory that the Cypress was outfitted with a new design of telescoping hatch covers patented in 1904 
The initial iteration of this design was thought to provide a sufficiently watertight seal. This assumption proved dangerous on other ships. In September 1905, the freighter Powell Stackhouse encountered a massive storm on Lake Superior. Equipped with the same telescoping hatches, Captain Millen had to interrupt their voyage and lighten the ship's load in Marine City, Michigan. He reported that he saw his hatches spring as waves hit. This springing motion allowed massive amounts of water into the ship. A year later, in November 1906, another new freighter, the B.F. Jones, found itself in a rough November gale. Outfitted with the same telescoping hatches, the violent waves pummeled the ship, ripping off a number of hatch leaves and allowing a massive amount of water into the ship. Fortunately, they were able to reach calmer waters where they were able to pump out the water and return the ship to an even keel. The captain later reported that the ship's hatches were unmanageable in heavy seas. These ships were quickly outfitted with canvas tarpaulins. It was clear that this was essential equipment, and the company that owned the Cyprus quietly made sure that all their vessels received a set. On the first leg of the Cyprus's final voyage, Captain Hike's wife Helen and his two sons, 16-year-old Ansel and 12-year-old Franklin, joined their father on his new command. Several initial news stories actually reported that the entire family was lost with the ship, but fortunately, they left before her final leg to visit family in St. Paul, Minnesota. Before leaving the ship, Franklin overheard a conversation between his father and first mate John Smith as the two men inspected the ship's hatches. He clearly recalled his father saying in frustration, I'll never make another trip without tarps. Even with modern research, what exactly happened that night remains unclear. Why was the Cyprus ever allowed to leave port without tarps? Who made that fateful decision? More than 100 years later, with everyone involved long since gone, we may never know what caused the mistake that led to the deaths of 22 people and the loss of a brand new freighter. The story of the Cyprus now serves as a chilling reminder of Lake Superior's fury and the faith sailors place in their vessels. One oversight, especially in the days before modern safety equipment, can prove catastrophic. Thank you so much for watching. If you liked what you saw, please leave a like and comment down below and subscribe for more stories like this one. I'd like to give a special shout out, as always, to my heroic crew over on Patreon. Their support keeps this channel chugging along. All right, crew, till the next one. Be nice to people. <laughs>